When I was just 15 years old, something terrifying happened to me and my best friend, Thomas. It was a weekend, and Thomas's parents were going to be away, so he invited me over for a sleepover. Excited for a weekend of fun, I rode my bike to Thomas's house and carefully parked it in his backyard before sneaking in through the back door. As soon as I entered, I saw a chaotic scene. The living room was a mess with video game controllers strewn across the floor and half-empty bags of popcorn and snacks scattered everywhere. Thomas and I were ready for a night of gaming, jumping from FIFA to Call of Duty and indulging in junk food galore. As the night went on, we started to get bored of the video games and decided to watch a movie instead. But even that couldn't hold our attention for long. We craved excitement and mischief, so we hatched a plan to make prank phone calls. It was getting close to 10 o'clock when we started dialing random numbers, hoping to get someone on the other end of the line. After a few unsuccessful attempts, my luck changed. On the fourth try, someone finally answered. A deep and rough voice replied with a casual, yeah, instead of the expected hello. Thomas, who couldn't hold back his laughter, made me stumble with my words, and I burst into laughter too. I was terrible at prank calls, and it was evident. The guy on the other end remained silent, and I quickly regained my composure, trying to salvage the call. I awkwardly asked, Uh, sir, would it be alright if I borrowed one of the wheels from your car? I pretended my name was Bob, but the guy interrupted me, asking, What's your name, kid? I hesitated for a moment, then nervously replied, My name is Bob. But he didn't believe me. He said, Really? You sure it's not Thomas? It hit me like a brick. I looked at Thomas, whose face was filled with fear. We hung up the phone, not wanting to stay on the line with whoever that was for another second. Confused and frightened, we turned to each other, seeking answers. Thomas, who the hell was that? I asked, my voice trembling. I... I don't know, he stammered. Does your caller ID display your name or something? No, I replied, my mind racing. It shows my dad's name. We hurriedly sat down at the computer, searching for answers on how someone could have gotten Thomas' name so quickly. It didn't make sense. He was too young to be on any personal information-sharing websites. Frustrated by the lack of information, we decided to ask for help on Yahoo Answers, hoping someone had experienced something similar. Unfortunately, no one could provide any answers. We contemplated calling Thomas' dad, but he wasn't supposed to have anyone over for the weekend. Fearful of getting in trouble, he hesitated to make the call. So, we resolved to sleep in the living room, hoping that staying together would provide some sense of security. We resumed watching the unfinished movie, trying to put the unsettling phone call behind us. But the memory lingered in the back of our minds. Little did we know that our night was about to take a horrifying turn. Suddenly, we heard the front storm door creak open, and the doorknob of the front door began to turn. Panic set in as we realized someone was trying to get inside. Thomas turned off the TV, and I rushed to the window to catch a glimpse of who it might be. I cautiously peeked through the blinds and saw a tall figure standing outside. The stranger noticed the movement of the blinds and turned his gaze directly at me. My heart raced, and I instinctively yanked the blinds shut. We both hurriedly hid in the kitchen, straining our ears to listen for any further noises. To our horror, we heard the gate to the backyard open, the very gate we forgot to shut. The intruder was getting closer. I cursed myself for the oversight. Thomas urged me to go and close the back door, and without hesitation, I darted down the hallway leading to the back. As I reached the hallway, I froze. A shadowy figure stood outside the back door, peering into the house. I held my breath, hoping he hadn't noticed me. Slowly, he opened the door and stepped inside. Fear gripped me as I tiptoed back to the kitchen, motioning for Thomas to follow me upstairs. We ascended the stairs as silently as possible, careful not to make a sound. Once in his room, we closed the door gently, doing our best not to alert the intruder. We had a momentary sense of safety, hiding under his bed where the cloth covering concealed us completely. We listened intently as the intruder made his way through the house. The doors creaked open, each one getting closer to the stairs. The thumps on the steps grew louder and soon he was right outside the bedroom door. Time seemed to slow as the doorknob turned. The door opened, and our hearts pounded in our chests. The intruder's footsteps moved across the room, making their way to the closet. The sound of coat hangers sliding and jackets brushing against each other filled the air. Dread consumed me as the footsteps approached the bed, 
and then everything fell silent. I held my breath, my heartbeats echoing in my ears. Thomas breathing, now too loud, threatened to give us away. I placed my hand over his mouth, praying he would stay quiet. We remained still, not daring to make a sound. Minutes stretched into an eternity, and I started to think that maybe the intruder had left the room. I cautiously removed my hand from Thomas' mouth and whispered in his ear, Do you think we can make a run for it? Before he could respond, an indescribable bone-chilling scream pierced the silence. The scream seemed to reverberate through the very walls of the house, freezing us in terror. The scream came from Thomas' mouth, and it was filled with fear and horror. In an instant, the intruder had seemingly snatched Thomas from under the bed. Without a second thought, adrenaline coursing through my veins, I crawled out and witnessed the horrifying sight before me. Thomas struggling with the man, panic and desperation fueled my actions. Frantically searching for anything I could use as a weapon, my eyes landed on a screwdriver sitting on Thomas's nightstand. I grabbed it and hurried over to the struggling figures. In a surge of desperation, I drove the screwdriver into the man's back. He let go of Thomas, letting out a gut-wrenching scream of agony. It was our chance to escape. We sprinted out of the room, down the stairs, and out into the open. Running onto the road would have been too risky. So we dove into the nearby tree line, seeking cover behind a bush. We huddled together, breathless and terrified, watching as the man emerged from the house. He stood outside for a moment, scanning the surroundings, his eyes seemingly searching for something. I held my breath, praying he wouldn't spot us. Slowly, he turned his head in our direction, his gaze passing just inches from our hiding spot. I ducked lower behind the bush, afraid to even blink. A voice called out from a distance, interrupting the man's search. Joe, he's coming, it said. Confused and frightened, we exchanged looks of uncertainty. The man turned away from us, heading in the direction of the voice. We waited, listening intently until the sounds of his footsteps faded into the distance. It was finally safe to move. With a feeling of fear and anxiety, we made our way back to Thomas's backyard, ensuring to shut the back door this time. Inside, we immediately called the police. Thomas stayed on the line with them, relaying our terrifying ordeal while I patrolled the back windows, on high alert for any signs of the intruder's return. The darkness outside made it nearly impossible to see anything. Fueled by a mix of fear and determination, I made a bold decision. I switched on the backyard lights. The sudden burst of illumination revealed a chilling sight. In the distance, near the edge of the woods, stood the man staring directly at us. My blood turned to ice as he vanished back into the woods, disappearing from sight. That was the last time either of us ever saw him. The following years passed without any further incidents. No eerie knocks at the windows or unsettling encounters. It seemed the nightmare had come to an end. Do I wonder if the prank call had something to do with the break-in? Perhaps. It doesn't entirely make sense. But the coincidence is hard to ignore. Even now, after five years, the memory of that night haunts me. But we were fortunate enough to survive. And for that, I'm grateful. My name is Sarah and I want to share a really scary experience I had while working at a Walmart in a small town called Riverside. I'm only 20 years old, and since I'm not going to school full-time, my boss would often put me on the overnight shift. Our store used to be open 24 hours a day, being a super center and all. One particular night, my shift was from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. It was an eerie time to work because the store was mostly empty, especially since we were located in the countryside but it was a crucial time for restocking, so a few of us employees would stay back and handle stock work. There were usually one or two employees at the registers up front. I started my night folding pants in the men's department, making sure everything was neat and tidy. Since there weren't many people around, I liked to keep my headphones on. There was usually no one to tell me to take them out anyway. Around 11.30 p.m., a customer came up to me in the jeans section, it wasn't too unusual for people to come in and shop until around midnight. The customer asked me if we had any more of a specific pair of pants in a different waist size. I apologized and explained that we only had whatever was on the rack. The customer thanked me and walked away, but something felt awkward about our interaction. We accidentally made eye contact as he stood by the rack, putting the jeans back. It gave me a weird feeling, 
but I shrugged it off and continued with my work. As time passed, the store started to look like a ghost town. There was no one to be seen as far as my eyes could see. It must have been around 1 a.m. when I made my way over to the appliances section. I was busy shuttling back and forth with boxes from the back section where we kept all the items that were yet to be put out. With a wagon full of boxes, I approached one of the aisles to stock the shelves. Since they were empty, I could see through to the next aisle, and that's when I noticed someone watching me. It was the same customer from two hours earlier. How could he still be in the store without making it obvious? I took a closer look and his eyes looked strangely familiar. It made me feel uneasy. I decided to get a better view and stepped closer, trying not to draw attention. Sure enough, it was him. But there was something off about him. His hands were completely empty. How could he be shopping for two hours without picking up a single thing? My instincts told me that something wasn't right. I quickly finished restocking the shelves with coffee machines and other appliances, then brought the empty wagon back to the back area. I needed a moment to gather my thoughts and calm down, so I hung out in the employee lounge for a while. I played on my phone, trying to distract myself from the creepy encounter. When I figured it was time to get back to work, I decided to switch things up and focus on grocery work instead. I thought being in a different part of the store might help ease my nerves. I went into the dairy cooler and started filling crates with milk and yogurts. It was a time-consuming task since I had to check the dates on the products and ensure everything was in order. Amidst the loud sound of the giant refrigerators keeping the cooler cold, I suddenly heard the door to the dairy cooler burst open. My heart skipped a beat. There was a small gap in the boxes sitting on one of the pallets that allowed me to peek through to the cooler's door. And there he was, that same customer. Panic filled me, and I quickly took cover under one of the shelves, pushing a big box full of eggs in front of me. The loud refrigerators masked any noise I made. I hid behind that box, keeping my head down, and prayed that he would leave soon. I expected to hear the doors of the cooler open and close at any moment. Minutes turned into what felt like an eternity, and fear consumed me. Finally, gathering some courage, I lifted my head from my arms and looked up in front of the box. To my horror, he was right there, standing over the box, staring at me with a twisted smile on his face. I couldn't help but scream, and he instinctively tried to put his hand on my mouth to muffle the sound. I wouldn't let him silence me. In a moment of desperation, I pushed the box of eggs toward him, causing them to fall to the floor. It startled him, and he took a step back, momentarily stunned. Not wasting a second, I sprinted past him. Surprisingly, he didn't grab me, and I kept running until I found another stock worker named Tim. Tears streaming down my face, I pleaded for him to help me. Tim listened, and quickly realized the seriousness of the situation. Suddenly, the man from the dairy cooler walked up to the two of us, acting like nothing was wrong. He apologized, claiming to be from the Walmart corporate office, and that he was merely checking to ensure everything was running smoothly. He said his name is Tom and he didn't mean to scare me in that he was just checking up on me in the dairy cooler to make sure I wasn't slacking off. Tim seemed to believe his story, but I had my doubts. I mustered the courage to ask the man why he put his hand on my mouth, and he nervously explained that he was trying to avoid making a scene. He then had the audacity to give me the order to finish up the appliance section and disappeared as he hurriedly walked away down the aisle. Filled with disbelief and fear, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was seriously wrong. The next day, I mustered up the courage to call one of the managers, Lisa, and shared the terrifying encounter with her. I asked if there was supposed to be a visit from corporate the night before, and if a creepy man named Tom sounded familiar. Lisa assured me that it sounded like complete nonsense. There was no record of anyone from corporate named Tom who was supposed to visit, and no one from corporate would ever be in the store at 2 a.m., Concerned for my safety, Lisa and the management team checked the camera footage. To their shock and horror, they discovered that this man had indeed been stalking me between the aisles for the better part of the first few hours of my shift. The incident was reported to the police, and they began their investigation. Margaret, another manager, was extremely supportive and understanding. She assured me that I wouldn't have to do night shifts anymore. I still work at Walmart but now I mostly handle day stock or work as a cashier, where I feel safer and more secure. When I was a young child, my family and I lived in three different houses. The first house was where we lived with just my parents and me. 
We spent the first 15 years of my life in that cozy home. And then we moved to the second house, where we stayed for the next seven years. Finally, we moved to our current house, where we live happily as a family. In our first house, which was the smallest and coziest of them all, my brother and I lived with our parents. We didn't have any neighbors our age, so we didn't have many chances to make friends. There were two kids who lived next door with their dad, but we barely spoke to them. It was odd because we knew their names, Eric and Todd, even though we had only exchanged a few words with them throughout our lives. One sunny day, while my brother and I were playing basketball in the driveway, Todd from next door came over to us and started a conversation. I couldn't recall the exact words we said, but I do remember that he asked us if it was true that we were moving. As the older brother, I did most of the talking. Todd seemed to be around the same age as me. By the end of our conversation, he surprised me by inviting me to go with him and his brother to shoot BB guns near the river in the woods down the road. Since it was the weekend and I didn't have any plans, I agreed to join them. My little brother, catching on to the excitement, asked if he could come along too. Todd said, yeah, and walked away. The next day, just an hour before dusk, Eric and Todd rang our doorbell. We were quick to answer because we hadn't told our parents about our plan to go shooting BB guns. It felt strange to see Eric and Todd in full camo gear, carrying a duffel bag filled with BB guns. The level of seriousness on their faces was quite peculiar, and my brother and I struggled to hold back our laughter. But despite the oddness, we followed them towards the woods, exchanging only a few words along the way. Once we reached the woods, Todd dropped the duffel bag onto the ground and unzipped it. Meanwhile, Eric aggressively snapped a branch off a nearby tree and threw it into the river. My brother and I exchanged puzzled glances. Then, Todd handed each of us a BB gun from the bag. It was at that moment he dropped a bombshell on us. The guns were not toys. They were real guns. My heart raced with a mix of anger and confusion. I swiftly took the guns from my brother's hands and placed them back in the bag, explaining that we weren't comfortable with this and that we had to leave. Eric stopped firing and both boys looked at us, wearing expressions that seemed half angry. Suddenly, one of them yelled a curse word at us as we walked away. I had always suspected that Eric and Todd were troubled kids, but this incident confirmed it. I immediately instructed my brother not to speak to them for the remainder of our time living in that house. That night, something unsettling happened. I woke up to a chilly breeze hitting my face, only to discover that my window was wide open. As I turned to look, I felt a hard object pressed against the back of my head. The cold head object was a gun. Behind me, Todd whispered and warned me never to tell anyone, especially his dad, about the guns or the visit. He threatened to come back and harm my entire family if I dared to speak up. Fearfully, I replied, Okay. With a push of his gun against my head, Todd left through my window, disappearing into the darkness. From that night onwards, for months on end, I would catch glimpses of either Todd or Eric peering into my room or my brother's room through a certain window of their house. Their behavior grew increasingly strange as the day of our move drew nearer. Just a week before our departure, the torment reached its peak. One night, around 1 a.m., a rock was hurled at my window. As I opened it, trembling with fear, I saw Todd aiming a pistol up towards me. Panic coursed through my veins as I imagined the worst, but then unexpectedly the two boys burst into laughter. I overheard one of them referring to me using a hurtful and offensive word. This heartbreaking insult, along with a couple more instances of their harassment that week, solidified my belief that it was the perfect time for us to move and leave that troubled neighborhood behind. Throughout those years, neither my brother nor I confided in anyone about Eric and Todd or the threats we endured. All I knew was that those two boys were troubled souls, and it was a blessing that we escaped from that environment when we did. We started a new chapter in our lives, leaving behind the haunting memories and focusing on brighter days ahead. I worked as a night janitor at our local Storyville Elementary School. My job was to make sure everything was clean and tidy before the students arrived in the morning. Most nights, I was the only one working the night shift because there wasn't really a need for more than one person. It was a quiet job, and I liked being alone most of the time. One night, as usual, I started my work by cleaning the downstairs classrooms. I mopped the floors, emptied the trash bins, and made sure everything was in order. Then, I made my way up to the upstairs classrooms. 
It was a big school, and sometimes it felt a bit spooky, especially at night. As I was mopping the floor in one of the social studies classrooms, something caught my attention. From the corner of my eye, I noticed that the lights in a classroom across the school turned on. It wasn't like they were accidentally left on. Someone deliberately switched them on. My heart started beating faster and chills ran down my spine. Who could be in the school at this hour? I cautiously peered across the hallway to get a better look. There I saw a figure walking towards the window of the classroom. It was a man maybe in his 30s or 40s with black hair and not much facial hair. He stopped in front of the window and stared straight at me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know what to do. Should I confront him? Run away? Call the police? Feeling a mix of fear and curiosity, I approached the window for a closer look. The man raised his hand and began waving at me slowly. It sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't understand why he was there or what he wanted. In panic, I quickly pulled down the blinds, trying to catch my breath and gather my thoughts. After a moment, I decided to lift the blinds back up to see if the man was still there. To my relief, the lights in the room across the school were now off. My heart raced with the thought that he might be making his way towards the classroom I was in. Fear took over, and without thinking twice, I ran down the stairs and out of the back door of the school. My own safety became the most important thing at that moment. The next day, I discovered that the school's security cameras had captured something truly chilling. During the night, the man emerged from the basement and started wandering around the school. When I saw the footage, his appearance disturbed me even more. He had an unsettling look, and it made me feel uneasy just looking at his face. But what creeped me out the most was that the camera revealed him going back into the basement and never coming out. It was as if he vanished into thin air. I couldn't help but wonder if there were hidden rooms or secret exits in the basement that nobody knew about. It was a terrifying thought, and it made me question the true nature of the school. Since that incident, my job as a night janitor has become more terrifying than ever before. My best friend Alex and I were both 18 years old and filled with curiosity. We had heard rumors about an abandoned asylum in our town, which was said to be haunted. It was a moonless night, long after midnight, when we decided to embark on a thrilling exploration. We grabbed our video cameras, hoping to capture some spine-chilling footage. At that time, YouTube was still fairly new, and exploring spooky places was all the rage for online videos. With Alex behind the wheel, we set off towards the ominous asylum, the road was eerily empty, devoid of any passing cars. As we arrived, we noticed a hole in the fence that someone had previously cut. We squeezed through, equipped with flashlights to guide our way. Carefully, we climbed through one of the broken windows, stepping over old planks that had once barred entry. Inside, broken glass and graffiti were scattered everywhere, lending a ghostly atmosphere to the place. The creaking floors hinted at the crumbling state of the building, and holes in the wood revealed darkness below. We were too scared to shine our lights down into those depths. Although we shared a few nervous laughs, the chilling air clung to us, heightening our fear. The asylum turned out to be enormous, with countless rooms to explore. In one small chamber, we stumbled upon a dental chair and other eerie medical equipment. The sight sent shivers down our spines, making us feel increasingly unsettled. But the most unsettling room of all was the bathroom. As we stepped inside, a constant dripping sound emanated from one of the stalls. Our curiosity got the better of us, and we attempted to open it, only to find it locked tight. There was only a small opening at the bottom, far too narrow for us to crawl through. We hastily abandoned the room, overcome with a deep sense of unease. Behind another door, we discovered a stairway leading either upstairs or downstairs. In pursuit of capturing the scariest footage possible, we chose to venture downstairs into the unknown. The hallways in this lower level had an even more chilling aura with the added mystery of being underground. On a bulletin board along the wall, we stumbled upon a collection of old photos and news articles, each one hinting at the asylum's dark past. Alex and I stood there, studying the pictures, when a sudden metallic noise echoed from down the hallway. We turned our flashlights toward the sound, and our hearts nearly stopped. We saw what seemed to be a tall, shadowy figure disappearing into one of the rooms. Fear consumed us and without a moment's hesitation, we sprinted back in the direction we came from. The sound of our footsteps was soon joined by another set of steps behind us, clearly following us. Panic consumed us, and screams escaped our lips as we raced up the stairs, 
dreading the thought of being grabbed and dragged back into the darkness. Finally, we reached the main hall and the window through which we had entered. Gasping for breath, we stumbled outside, leaving the asylum and its haunting secrets behind. And suddenly through the window, we heard the door to the stairway creak open, confirming our worst fears. We wasted no time, hastily reaching Alex's car and sped away without ever looking back. As we drove off into the safety of the night, a mix of relief and lingering terror flooded our veins. We vowed never to return to that sinister place again. When I was 27 years old, I moved out of my parents' house to start a new chapter of my life with my girlfriend, Lily. We found a cozy apartment that suited our needs, even though we weren't the richest couple in the world. It was our own little space, and we were excited to make it our own. However, on our very first night, we realized that living next to our neighbor was going to be a challenge. From the moment we stepped into our new home, we could hear loud yelling and thumping sounds coming from the adjacent apartment. It seemed like they never slept, as the noises continued throughout the night. Lily suggested that I go over and talk to them, but I thought it would be better to give them the benefit of the doubt for one more night. If the disturbances persisted, I promised her that I would confront them the following night. During the day, as we busied ourselves with setting up our furniture, the neighbor remained strangely quiet. We hoped it was a good sign. But as night fell, the freakish yelling and banging resumed, even more intense this time. We couldn't ignore it any longer. I gathered my courage and decided to go and address the situation. I knocked on the neighbor's door, and to my surprise a middle-aged woman with pure white hair and pale skin answered. Her voice was raspy, as if she'd been smoking cigarettes for decades. I politely asked her to keep the noise down, hoping for a reasonable response. Instead, she told me to back off and mind my own business before abruptly slamming the door shut. The disturbances only grew louder after that encounter much to our dismay. Lily insisted that we report the neighbor to the apartment management, so the next day, I went to the front desk to discuss the issues we were facing. I mentioned the couple living in the noisy apartment, but the doorman looked puzzled. He told me that only a woman named Mrs. Thompson lived there. Her husband had passed away five years ago, and she has registered herself as the sole occupant of the apartment. The doorman agreed to check the apartment to verify our claims. He approached Mrs. Thompson's door and she allowed him inside. I waited anxiously, hoping for some resolution. When he returned, he had a bewildered expression on his face. He informed me that Mrs. Thompson was indeed alone in her apartment. It was baffling. How could she create so much noise if she was the only one there? Despite this revelation, the doorman kindly asked her to keep the noise level down. I thanked him for his help and went back to our apartment feeling a mix of confusion and relief. That night, as we lay in bed, hoping for a peaceful sleep, I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. I turned to see a figure standing by Lily's side of the bed. My heart raced, and I whispered urgently, Lily, wake up! But to my astonishment, Lily was already awake and staring wide-eyed at the figure. The woman's voice, raspy and unnerving, filled the room. You shouldn't have reported me, she hissed with a chilling tone. Fear surged through me, and I fumbled to switch on the lamp, desperate to see what was happening. But by the time the room was bathed in light, the woman had vanished into thin air. Lily's terrified screams pierced the silence, and I held her tightly, trying to make sense of the terrifying encounter. In a panic, I slipped on my shoes and rushed out into the hallway in my robe, desperately searching for any sign of the woman who was in our room. Her apartment door stood wide open, but there was no trace of her inside. Where could she have gone so suddenly? It was as if she had vanished into thin air. Days turned into a week, and there was no news or sign of Mrs. Thompson. We searched tirelessly, reaching out to the police and our friends for help, but she remained missing. The apartment building grew darker and colder without her presence. One night, as we tried to rest, we were startled by four loud knocks on our walls. These were not mere thumps. They were deliberate knocks meant to get our attention. The sound sent shivers down my spine, and we knew it was time to leave. The next day, we packed our belongings and left that apartment for good. We couldn't bear the eerie and unexplained occurrences any longer. The mystery of the neighbor, the inexplicable disappearance of Mrs. Thompson, and the haunting knocks on the walls would forever remain unanswered.